I never know what psalm is going to fall on a given Sunday until I actually get into it. And so when I saw that this psalm was going to fall on Father's Day, I had anticipated, uh, before I went on vacation, actually uh, putting together a Father's Day message, uh, not out of the Psalter. But then when I started studying Psalm 8, I thought to myself, well, what it says is so pertinent to fathers. I mean, it, it's applicable to everybody, uh, but it is so, so pertinent to fathers. Uh, I think I'm just going to stay in, in Psalm 8 for Father's Day because it's a word from the Lord. Uh, because what, what more imp- important thing could a man know who's a father than what his purpose in life is? I mean, is that not the most important question in all of life? And if your father actually knew what his purpose was before God, Uh, that would impact the family in a positive way. Uh, it would impact the, the country in a positive way. And so I, I want to stay with Psalm 8 because I think it's so uh, appropriate for where we're at uh, as a people, as a nation, uh, to hear uh, from God, what are we to be about? Because if a man uh, who leads his family understands why he's on the planet, that, that, that solves a whole lot of social ills because he's living for God, not for himself. And so we want to, um, to stay in this great psalm, and we want to look at it because it asks the, the question that everybody wants to know as you move through life, what is my life's purpose? Like, why am I here? Uh, and we want to review because uh, uh, we want to make sure that you understand uh, the, the, the content of this psalm. So we want to read, uh, starting with verse 1 that we covered in our last study, uh, which introduces us to the first answer to the question, what is my life's purpose? Uh, and as we're going to see from verses 1 and 2 and Uh, verse 9, uh, your life's purpose uh, is to realize who God is. I mean, the answer to a lot of our social issues is not more laws, not more l- rules and regulations, not all the things our culture is attempting to do, as well-minded as they might be, uh, but the answer for our social ills uh, is a relationship with the living God. God's the answer. That's the power of the gospel of Christ. Um, and, and if people understand who God is, they can under then, understand then how to live for God. Then they can also understand how they're supposed to f- treat their fellow uh, human uh, created in the likeness of God. Now, all that's covered in this great psalm. So let's review. Uh, David says in this song, uh, for the choir director on the Gatith, which I told you uh, in our last study was like a flute. He says it's a psalm of David. And then he says, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens, with an exclamation point. Uh, He says, from the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you've established the strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the vengeful cease. And then he says again, at the close of the psalm, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. I told you that is a rhetorical device called inclusio. It's wrapping a bow around the package to say, I really want you to focus on who God is. Why? Because man in his sinfulness tends to look at man first and God may be way down the list. But he says, no, if you want to live life correctly, if you want to have true peace in your life, he said, you've got to focus on who God is. And so we talked last week about the importance of knowing God. And what greater thing can a dad know, a father know, than who God is? Because that's going to impact how he raises his children how he cares for his children, how he gives them wisdom and counsel, etc. All those things will be seen in light of God, which will be transferred down to a family. Um, DeMario Davis, uh, linebacker for the NFL, I think he played for the Saints at one point. Um, I'm not sure if he's still there. Is there even football anymore? Uh, so I don't know. Um, again, it's hard to do humor to an almost empty room, but um, that is kind of humorous. I, I don't know if there's football. I don't even know if there's baseball. Um, But DeMario Davis, uh, linebacker for the NFL, uh, uh, was not raised in a Christian home. Uh, and he said recently that he became a Christian while he was in college. Uh, and so he didn't have, he said, my dad was a great man, but he wasn't a spiritual Christian man. Uh, he says uh, that his fatherhood in learning, I'm, I'm quoting him, how to be a father, a father that he says reflects the glory of God to his children. He says, it, it, this came from my relationship with God. His personal relationship. So he said, I didn't have a, a model of how to know God until I got to college and someone introduced me to, to Christ. And he said, now that I'm a man, I know how to be a man to my family because I, I get that in my daily devotional walk with God. That's amazing. What, what's he basically saying? He's telling you as an NFL linebacker, which is a, a feared individual when you're playing football, um, what's he telling you? He says, my life purpose is to know God. To know God. That makes me an awesome father. There's another one of his friends that he's played football with. His name is uh, Benjamin Watson. 
Uh, he played for the New Orleans Saints, also uh, played for the Patriots. Um, and I don't really know how their season is going to go since they lost their quarterback, but we'll pray for them. They, they need assistance. Um, uh, Benjamin Watson uh, says this about his walk with God and fatherhood. He says, I was always told that a man is supposed to be the priest, the prophet, uh, the protector, and the provider of his home. Then he goes on to say, well, that's not easy. Uh, but he says, understanding uh, all of this through the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, I'm given the power to do it. Amazing, isn't it? Big old muscular football player tells you, hey, I've learned long ago, Psalm 8's essence is my life purpose is to know God. And he talks about uh, in his testimony this weekend, uh, as he was interviewed, uh, I think on Fox News, where he, he, he talked about just how important his, his biblical background was in growing up. So, so just by way of review, uh, uh, what is my life's purpose? It's to realize who God is. Then that impacts how you live your life. And these two great men have said, this p impacts how I, I, I raise my family. So I would submit to you, if uh, you're watching this video and you don't know God, um, then you're, you're missing out on the biggest answer on how to pastor and minister your family and grow great children and have a great family relationship. But that's, that's all part of that first point. Uh, we want to look beyond that at, at point number two. Like, why else are you here other than to know who God is? Because once you know who God is, what he wants from you, what he wants from your role is very specific. He talks about that beginning in verse 3. He's going to tell us here in verses 3 to 8, uh, my purpose, or your purpose, is number one, to realize who God is and have a relationship with him, by the way, which can only come from a faith relationship with Jesus Christ, the Savior. And then that naturally leads to, well, what's my role in life? What am I supposed to be doing other than worshiping God and walking with God? He says, uh, well, let's explain your role. This is going to take me a few minutes to unpack this. He says in verse 3, David speaking, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, uh, we'll stop right there because he, he says, When I consider what's above my head, then he's going to eventually turn in verse 4 to say, Who is man? We'll get there in just a minute. He says, when I, God, I'm, I'm a man who looks up. I don't look around. He says, when I'm out on a hillside at night, he said, I, I look up and I, I see the things that you've made. You can probably uh, ascertain that uh, David was probably looking up at the sky at nighttime because he talks about uh, nighttime things like the moon and the stars. Uh, and who hasn't walked out on a beautiful evening, uh, especially when you're in a place where there's not a whole lot of uh, city light and you can see the stars and look up and just see the glory of the heavens above you. He says, when I look up and see that, uh, it just, he said it takes my breath away. He, he says it's like the, uh, the, 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 I see the work of your fingers. It's most interesting that God made everything by the work of his fingers. Why, why didn't he say the work of your hands? Uh, well, for two reasons, I think. Number one, he wants to picture God as the, 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 the master potter. That uh, when he created the cosmos... When he started time and space as we know it, dimensionality, when he started everything, um, he was like a, a, a potter with a wheel fashioning this. And when you look at the complexity and the wonder and the beauty of the cosmos, you can see that it has everything artistic about it because it was like a potter made everything. But then he says, this was made by your fingers, which I think he said fingers and not hands to emphasize how easily God did this. It wasn't hard for him. It wasn't hard for him. And so he said, you have fashioned these things by your very fingers. I mean, no problem for you, God. Uh, I talked about Dr. Hugh Ross, uh, astrophysicist, last week. Uh, I read uh, one of his books when I was on vacation. Um, so I have to refer back to what I read because it's so appropriate to this psalm. The bear in mind, in case you get lost, my life purpose is to know who God is. And he give me, gives me much evidence that, that he is by the complexities of the cosmos that I see as handiwork. Um, but it's, the more I understand God's greatness, the more I can understand who I am and why I am here in light of who he is. So here's what Ross uh, says as an astrophysicist. And I have a picture of a shot from the, the Hubble uh, Deep Space Telescope. Uh, and I'm going to read this. Uh, and maybe, maybe you have a PhD or two way beyond me. But uh, when I read this, I'm like, what did he just say? Uh, but let's, let's move through it because it's so profound. Notice what he says. It says the, ultra deep, uh, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field Telescope showed astronomers when they took a picture of this quadrant of the sky, that, that quadrant. 
He says, uh, uh, show the astronomers slightly more than 10,000 galaxies in that quadrant of the picture. He says, given the observed uniformity of the cosmos on large distance scales, researchers could then do the math. They could extrapolate. Not that anybody in our church would do this. Extrapolation. What did they extrapolate? He says that there are more than 10,000 galaxies multiplied over the whole area of the sky would total 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe. So I guess that's probability. If you got 10,000 galaxies uh, on all those little pinpoints there, and God helped the man that had to count all these, he says, then there are, th these two billion galaxies contain on average about 200 billion stars per galaxy. So the total number of stars in these galaxies adds up to about 40 billion trillion. He says, that, that's, a, that's without an estimated 10 billion trillion stars contained in the observable universe of dwarf galaxies. He just left me there, probably you too. He says somewhere around 50 billion trillion stars make their home in our observable universe. Now, what in the world are we talking about? Well, uh, stuff above my pay grade. What, I, what he says after this in, in the next paragraph, I'm like, well, thank you for coming down to my level. What does he say next? He goes, this is a mind-boggling statement. <laughs> you know, like wrote in my book, uh, yeah, no, duh, yeah. Uh, it, these are figures beyond what I can comprehend. No kidding. The, the average distance between stars in our galaxy of thousands of galaxies, the average distance between stars, uh, he goes on to say, is 40 trillion miles. 40 trillion miles between stars just in our galaxy. If light's traveling at 186,000 miles uh, per hour, covers 6 trillion miles in a year, how many years will it take to to go from one star to another star just in our galaxy. Well, six times eight, no, it's probably six times seven is 42. That's probably close. Seven years, basically, to travel between one star and another just in, just in our galaxy. And you start thinking about this, and this is a lead to his point then, is like, who is man that you're concerned about him? But I want to first build the case for how great and massive God is. Here the thing is, it, the, the cosmos as we know it is massive. It's huge. It contains billions of galaxies. What about the moon? This is the stars. There's billions of stars. But then David says, God, I see the stars. Uh, he says, I also see the moon. I mean, like, how important is the moon? Well, uh, if you're from one of the coasts, like the west coast, the east coast, and you like to surf, you need the moon, don't you? Because if you got no moon, you got no surf. It's heavy, for, heavy on tidal pool. But here's what uh, Dr. Ross says about the moon, which I found fascinating. He says the moon's large mass relative to the Earth's, he says the moon's proximity to the Earth, and the fact that the moon is solo all play a crucial role in stabilizing the tilt of the Earth's rotational axis. He says other planets in our solar system which have no moons or moons relatively uh, insignificant in mass, experience chaotic tilting on their rotation uh, axis. Could you imagine if we couldn't predict our, our rotation on any given day? I mean, talk about the messed up stock market going up and down. I mean, you wouldn't be able to walk anywhere because I got gravitation, I, I don't have gravitation, etc. Imagine playing football in that situation. Uh, he says, the stability of the Earth's rotation axis tilted at 23.5 degrees over a long period of time protects Earth's life from disastrous climate changes. And you think that happened just by chance. No, no. We got the right moon in the right place at the right distance from the Earth to make sure we have the right tilt and it's predictable. So we have seasons, we have gravity, we have everything. Pure chance, no. Uh, the astrophysicist goes on to, to, uh, to state this. He says another reason the earth needs the moon's precise mass and present proximity has to do with uh, the influence of tides. A moon less massive or more distant from the earth and therefore smaller in the nighttime sky would mean weaker tides. Translated, no surfing. He says tides as powerful as those on earth are necessary to effectively cleanse the coastal seawaters from toxins and to enrich with the nutrients. Isn't that amazing? God thought of even that. He said the moon has an extraordinarily dark surface. He says it reflects, and I didn't know this until I read the book. He said it, it reflects 7% of, of light in the cosmos. That's it, 7%. He 
He says the earth by comparison reflects 39%. Uh, some of Jupiter's and Saturn's moons reflect 60 to 90%. Neptune reflects 73%. What's all that mean? If God gave us the wrong moon that was bigger and reflected more light, we could not see the stars with David. Why? Too much light. In a no-name galaxy called the Milky Way galaxy, uh, it has multiple arms that spin and rotate. On one of those arms is one planet with life on it. And God said, I'm going to put a sun that you can count on. It doesn't expand, it doesn't contract. It's a, it's a sun that you, it's pretty accountable to cr creating warmth for your planet. And I'm going to put a moon that reflects 7% of the light so that where you're located at one of the darkest places in your galaxy, you'll be able to look up and actually see the cosmos to see me. Not by accident. Who hasn't looked up and, uh, and seen the Big Dipper? I, as I told you last week, I looked up at Lake Tahoe two weeks ago and one night with Liz and said, wow, the R Big Dipper is right up above the, the house. When you look at the Big Dipper and, and you, you look at the, how it's constructed, uh, the, the handle of the, of the Little Dipper points to the, the North Star, does it not? Uh, and the Big Dipper, uh, you know, the, the end of the pot is flipped up on its side. It points directly to the North Star. Uh, Polaris. Polaris, it doesn't seem like it moves. And Polaris is really important for navigation. If uh, you, you uh, I had a pilot explaining to me, this to me the other day, just, you know, mariners uh, and, and pilots have used that if they need to, to, to navigate by the stars and to, and to have that particular star uh, in the north as, as, a, as, a, as a way to navigate is highly important. Um, Polaris is uh, 16,000 times brighter than our sun. 16,000 times brighter. And it's not constant. It pulsates. It gets really white hot and then it contracts. Imagine if our sun did that. Uh, it is estimated that if our sun was Polaris, we would go from a really nice day to 400 degree change in a given day. And you thought humidity was bad. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, wh how, what's the temperature now? Well, it's 80, 80, 80 degrees with 90% uh, humidity. Then imagine, that's at noon. Imagine if at 5 o'clock it was, no, it's 4,000 degrees, uh, etc. I mean, God put Polaris where he needed to put it so that we could uh, use it for navigational purposes. Uh, one professor, uh, uh, Donald B. DeYoung, who's an uh, astrophysicist, says, from any location on Earth above the equator, the angle of Polaris above the horizon determines your latitude. He says, for example, he says, if you're at a latitude of 41 degrees, the pole star will be 41 degrees above the northern horizon. He then goes on to say how early explorers and sea mariners use sextants to, to navigate because it was predictable. Who made all that predictable? Well, the unseen, all-wise God who just happened to place that, that particular star where it needed to be so we could see the greatness of God. So this is the, the immensity. Hopefully, I've given you a taste of the immensity of the cosmos. Why is that important? It's, it's majorly important. Look at verse 4. David says, I look up, I see the moon, I see the stars and all their grandeur. I see your fingerprints all over those things, God. And then he, he asked two questions. Question one, what is man? What is man? That you, God, take thought of him. Second question. What is the son of man that you would care for him? God, when I look up and I see the greatness that you, that, that you have, why in the world would you give mankind a second thought? Uh, the word here, uh, when he says, what is man that you take thought of him? The word uh, thought in Hebrew, it comes from the Greek, or the Hebrew verb, zakar, which means to remember and then take action, which is really interesting. While God is busy out in the cosmos with thousands and thousands of galaxies, as we saw from the Hubble Space Telescope, he's busy with all of that. And David says, while you're busy with all of that, you do what? You zakar me. God, in all of that, you think of me, David, sitting here on a hill with all my issues, all my problems, all my life, and you remember, oh, David. And then he says, what is a son of man that you care for him? Uh, the Hebrew word here, uh, pakad, uh, care, uh, very interesting. The, the word means to hunt somebody out, to seek them out, to look for them. 
You know, God's just not so busy making sure the cosmos runs like a, like a giant clock like it does. No, God remembers your name, remembers your situation, knows about it, and then he pocads you. He seeks you out. I mean, this is like Jesus, the good shepherd, all over again. It should be highly comforting. He says, when I think about the greatness of the cosmos and just how great you are, God, it causes me to, to look at myself and think, what is man that you even spend any time thinking about him? Because you're so far beyond us in every way. He says in verse five, he says, yet you have made him, man, a little lower than God, and you have crowned him like a king with glory and majesty. A man with all of his issues and limitations and sin. He says, you, you think about him. You care about him. You made him a little lower than God. Uh, there's a huge argument as exactly what that means in the translation. Uh, some translate that a little lower than God, Elohim. Others translate a little lower than the angels. Uh, and we can see from uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 7 and 9, where it talks about Jesus one day going to rectify all things and put all of his enemies under his feet. Um, and that Jesus, when he became a man, was made a little bit lower than an angel. It's, a, it's quoting from this text. So the Septuagint, the Greek version of the uh, Old Testament, took this word Elohim, God, uh, and translated that as angels. Um, that's how they apply it to Jesus. But I, I think it's more appropriate uh, to take the word Elohim here as God. Because uh, as my former Hebrew professor uh, from Dallas Seminary, Dr. Alan Ross, says in his commentary on Psalms, uh, what, what David is doing here, he's quoting from uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26, where he says, man has been made in the image of God, uh, and he's talking about Elohim here in this section. So Ross, and I think he's right to say, when God made man, he made him a little lower than who he is. So what's God like? Well, uh, God has communicable attributes and non-communicable attributes. Translated, he has attributes that he shared with us, and he has attributes that he did not share with us. So you could click down through the list with your family around the computer if we paused right now, but what are the, what are the attributes that didn't, he, didn't get communicated to us? Well, um, I'm not omnipresent. I'm not omniscient. I'm not omnipotent. He didn't give us those. those. Those are God's. But there are the things that he did communicate to us when he made us. He gave us volition, will, choice, purpose, intellect. He gave us the opportunity to gain wisdom, uh, to, to act in a good way, to, to pursue holiness if we choose, uh, to have compassion, etc. There's a lot of things that he shared with us about his character. There's things that are only reserved for him. But he says, when I created you, David says, when you created man, you made him a little bit lower than who you are. That is mind-boggling. And bear in mind, I want to emphasize, he made all races. He made all races a little lower than him. What's that mean? No one race is greater than the other race, right? No one race is greater than the other. Why? Well, because they're all made by God in his goodness to reflect him. We'll, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Gerald Wilson uh, says this in, in his uh, commentary on the Psalms. He says, having created them, men, as weak and powerless creatures with one foot firmly planted in the creaturely world, they share with the other animated beasts created on the sixth day. God goes on to plant the other human foot squarely and uniquely in the divine realm both by the unique gift of divine image and by the role of responsibility given to only, only to humans. That's man. He's planted firmly in this old world, the terrestrial world, but there's that celestial side of man, that spiritual side of man that the animals don't enjoy. And he put us down here at this out-of-the-way planet on the, the, the dark end of, the, of a Milky Way uh, galaxy arm spinning around. He put us out here uh, and he made us in his image which David says, it just boggles my mind that you would do that. What does this all mean? It means a lot to me, and I think it should mean a lot to you. Think of it this way. God, who created all of that immensity that is above our heads, that not only shows us that he's there, but tells us a lot about his character. He was so high and lofty above us and greater than us in all ways, but he condescended to our estate to make us in his image, all of us, no matter wh what race you have. What's that mean? That means every single race is important in whose eyes? God's eyes. Every single one of them. Which then leads pragmatically to say, no one race should think they're greater than the other race. Why? 
we're all made in the image of God. We're all made in the image of God. I, I fear uh, we as a nation spend too much time looking uh, on the terrestrial plane and not the celestial plane. Translated, I think we spend too much time looking at each other and not enough time looking at God. David says, I spend a lot of time looking at God and the things that he has made. Because he said, that helps me put in perspective who I am. He said, I, I feel insignificant in light of the greatness of the cosmos, but I see that you have made me with great significance. Translated, he's made every single person with great significance. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what your race is. He says, you are made to reflect the image of God, and he's given you a job to do. What's your job? He says in verse six, here's your purpose. He says, you've made him to rule over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. He says, what kind of things have you given us to take responsibility for? He's gonna list them for you in case you need some help. What does he say? You're responsible to take care of sheep, oxen, also the beasts of the field, wild beasts. He says, the birds of the heavens. I don't know how you feel about birds. Uh, he says, you're, you're responsible as best you can to care for the birds, the fish of the sea. Whatever passes through the paths of the sea, he just covered all, all, all the things that God has made. And, and here's the thing. Don't lose sight of this. If we are created to have dominion over the earth and care for the earth, you got to ask the question, am I taking care of the earth? Well, I look around me and I see a, a, a lot of people who are not doing that. And if we're supposed to take care of animals, how much so, so, so should we be taking care of each other? I mean, that is the message for the day. I mean, think about pre-fall Adam. He had it made. Would a lion run to Adam and not want to eat him? Answer, yes. And a, a lion was friendly. Um, gorillas didn't mind sitting down with Adam. They weren't going to, like, crush him. Uh, birds did not fly when, when Adam would get near them. I imagine. I mean, they would come right to him. I mean, uh, I was surrounded a couple weeks ago at Lake Tahoe because I happened to give some Canadian geese some bread. The rest of my vacation, they followed me on the beach. Trust in mind, it's about a 600-yard beach. Many, there was hardly anybody at Tahoe when I was there, so the beach was pretty empty. Uh, those eight, I counted them. It, there were 18 geese the whole week I was there. Where I went, they went. And they would just stand right by my lawn chair, just making all their noises and stuff. Uh, I wish they would have flown away. It was probably a, they were probably a taste of uh, the kingdom to come when, when the animals are not afraid of you. But pre-fall, I mean, Adam had it made. But post-fall, it's a different thing. Because sin came into the world, and so the animals feared men. So now when you're a fisherman trying to catch fish, good luck. Good luck. One of my friends who's a pastor went deep sea fishing. I uh, didn't catch anything. He went by Safeway. He bought some fish. <laughs> he got home. He's gone all day. The wife asked him, you know, how was your fishing day? It was awesome, man. Look at what I got. She's like, mm-hmm. What's up with the Safeway wrapper, you know? I mean, because, you know, pre-fall, the fish would come to you. You know, post-fall, I have prayed many times while fishing. Oh, God, you, you, you own all the fish in this lake. Uh, could you not just give your humble servant one? I've, I've gone away skunked many times. Uh, but it's the, it's, the, it's the fall. But with the fall, it, it doesn't mean that we lost our ability to, to govern the cosmos. We still have that responsibility, as tainted as we are. We still have the responsibility to govern the cosmos that God made to take care of the, the cosmos uh, within reason. So let's just put the cookies on a lower shelf because we have children who watch these sermons and things like that. I mean, if you're a father, you should be teaching your children how to look up at the heavens and look at the cosmos around you and tell them how this points to God and how God put you on the planet, not just to know him, but to respect others around you and to do your part to take care of well, your part of the world. So let's talk about a fish tank for just a minute. This is totally practical theology. It's a fish tank. What do the fish need in there to survive? Do you just buy the thing, drop the little fishies in there, and uh, never clean the, you know, the little device that goes with it to pump air in there? I mean, what happens if no one takes care of the fish tank? You get a lot of floaters, right? Am I right? And, and yeah, and, and so, so you can tell your children, as you teach them as a father, when you take care of the fish tank, you're doing God's duty. You're doing what God calls you to do. You're taking care of the cosmos. And you might laugh and think that's like the, uh, an elementary idea. It's a biblical idea because he's saying take care of the cosmos. Um, 
Think about your dog for just a minute if you have a dog. I have a simple question from you as your pastor. Is it trained? Now, your dog may look like that, uh, or you might have a big, you know, Rottweiler. I mean, whatever you have. But, it, but is it trained? Uh, I have a neighbor close to me who, I don't know, I think he needs to go to church and hear this message. Uh, because is he taking care of the cosmos? No. His dog, I think it's a hound dog. I hear it all the time. Arr, 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 all the time. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. Do something with that dog. Because God calls us as Christians to take the cosmos, the things that he's put on the planet, and train them. So years ago when Liz and I got a 130-pound uh, Rottweiler as a dog, uh, we knew immediately when we went on a walk, he took us on the walk. Uh, drug us around the block. And uh, so we, we went to a professional trainer, went to all the classes, had him professionally trained, because that is a spiritual thing to do. Not to let that dog run wild. So are you taking care of the, of the cosmos that God uh, has given to, given to you? When you uh, put uh, bait out in your uh, food out for birds, you know, and you've got one of those squirrel-proof uh, feeders. Is anything squirrel-proof? I mean, I think not. But, but when you're feeding the little animals around your, uh, around your place, are you not doing what God has called you to do, even in a small way? And as a father, you should be teaching your children Honey, we do these things, we treat our pets this way because this is how God would have us do this. Now, here's the thing. If we're called to take care of the animals on the planet with compassion and grace, how much more so a man made in the image of God? Again, how many people are abused in our culture by how people uh, all across the aisle talk to them and treat them when if they only knew the living God, they would talk completely differently to them. So, I don't know who you are or where you are, but we are put on the planet to rule and to reign. Uh, if you are a politician, and we have many in our church who are in the political world, you are put on the planet to run the country in such a way that it reflects the, the, the image of God. High, holy order, big order. Uh, if you are a person who's part of our population as a Christian, you are put here to make sure there's peace and safety and tranquility by how you run your own little family and how you respond to the government. It's, it's all part of God's plan. It's how we're made. And we give account one day for how we have done those things. Taking care of your, your, your life, so important. Uh, before I came here, uh, it rained, I don't even know, a couple inches at my house. It was brutal. Lightning, thunder, it sounded like World War III. Uh, but, but during the coronavirus, when I was totally bored, um, I spent a couple of days putting in subterranean um, uh, drainage system in my front yard, which is uh, multi-tiered and goes downhill to control the water flow. And it was fun to kind of sit in my uh, house and look out the front door to see all the water moving to where I sent it to. And I, I merely share this with you to tell you that's a spiritual experience. <laughs> Why? Because what did God say? I, I put you here to oversee the little animals, to care for them, to show them compassion, and to take care of the cosmos. As you're riding water around your, your house, I mean, it, it might seem laborious, but you're merely doing what God called you to do. Take care of the cosmos. I get a lot of uh, emails about how to take care of your cosmos. <laughs> um, a lot of people come to me and, and it sounds like a really deep spiritual problem, and then I find out it's got something to do with weed management. I'm like, are you kidding me? Uh, and I try to help as best I can, why? Uh, and we might laugh about this, but I mean, I do try to help as best I can. Why? Because I firmly believe it's not by accident Adam was a gardener in the garden. And when you step in and, and help people learn how to manage that part of the world where God put them, you're merely teaching them how to, to rule and master that part of the world where God told them, take care of that. So how do you take care of your pets? How do you take care of the things God's entrusted to you? And how well do you respect those around you made in the image of God? I think there's a, a lot of room for improvement because if we, we really look at who God is, we see our insignificance, the greatness of God, and then we see our significance because we do have much about God about us. We reflect him. Therefore, we should honor one another. Uh, last week, I gave you an acronym uh, to think about in light of what's going on in our culture. Uh, it was built around the concept of help. Point one was honor. Learn to honor one another. Why? Because we're made in the image of God. We're made in the image of God. Might we all, especially as men and fathers, teach our children to do these things based on who, who God is and to see the greatness in others. Let's pray. God, we, uh, we pause to give you thanks for who you are. 
uh, you speak in such a profound way. And it, it's just astonishing to think that with all that is on your plate, you would even pause to remember our name and our situation uh, and, and visit us. Uh, how humbling that is, how comforting that is. And God, forgive us when we have not uh, taken our image that reflects who you are in so many ways and we thought ourselves better than others when really we are all just uh, made from clay and, and, and have your spirit flowing in and through us. May we really have a better view of who we are and who others are in light of your greatness. May we as a people, as a nation, look up more often than not and then look at ourselves in the way that we should look at ourselves and treat each other the way that we should treat each other. And might you bless our fathers this day. Might it be a great day for them. And may they get much illumination from your good hand on how to shepherd in light of how you've created them in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.